Right. Good morning to everybody. Um, it was not Pastor Nate's preaching that went long, I promise you. Uh, fortunately and blessed uh, be to St. Peter's here, we had several guests and I was, I was speaking with them this morning um, and um, thankful for that. Uh, some were just visiting uh, friends, of the, friends of the congregation, some were looking at membership and even um, confirmation. So I'm um, glad that we um, are able to rev- provide that for people. Uh, continuing to study uh, in God's Word and, and continuing, continuing to be informed by, by Him and His Word. Um, this morning, as always, uh, prayers. And uh, while you're thinking about prayers, um, a thank you to, um, it's Larry and Carol who put together our snacks today, right? Yep, thank you very much for that. And uh, next week is Jerry Marilyn. Thank you. Okay, prayers. Uh, well, Ladies first, Barb. My sister Donna's having major surgery on Tuesday. Okay. We'll keep her keep her in prayers. Um, did you want to go into any specifics? You don't have to. No, okay. It's just going to be a long three to four hours. Yeah, that's that is a that's a major surgery. There, we'll keep her in our prayers and hope for a uh, quick recovery. Um, Kreutz, first name. See, this is, when I tell you I don't remember names. Rick. Rick, thank you. Yes, Rick. (laughs) I'm. (laughs) Great. Yeah, we'll pray for that. uh, A swift treatment plan. Okay. Uh, we'll make sure we pray for that. Now, all of you sitting over there, um, I'm sorry that this, the table was pushed back so much. It was for the uh, funeral dinner. If you feel so inclined, you can pull, pull that forward so that you can see more. Um, Susan and uh, Hannah, if you would like, we might be able to get maybe a table pulled in front for you. Would that be helpful? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's probably a couple seats over here. Oh, okay. Wonderful. The um, yeah, when when there's a funeral dinner or a wedding, it it really messes with our arrangement here. Um, But there's not much I can do about it because that was Saturday, and there wasn't enough people to put this all back together. Other prayers. All right. Um, Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and may it be uh, continue to uh, enliven us and uh, draw us ever closer to you. Lord, we ask that uh, you be with Donna, Barb's sister, in her major surgery Tuesday. Be with the doctors, nurses. Be with her own body as they uh, as she goes undergoes that surgery. Give her uh, quick recovery and healing. And speaking of healing, Lord, we ask that you be with Louise um, and Rick as they go to the doctor and uh, hear about a treatment plan um, for Louise. And we ask, Lord, that uh, it be swift and be um, uh, good for her. Lord, be with us all and those that are on our hearts and minds and all of our uh, pains and issues and sufferings. Lord, we uh, pray in your son's name. Amen. Amen. All right. thought there was something else I was going to tell you, but um, don't remember it right now. Maybe I'll remember when we're going through the study. Review. I, I like doing the review again because sometimes we miss something, sometimes we were out, so this keeps us on track. Oh, I remember what I was going to tell you. Um, next week, Pastor Nate will lead, be leading Bible study, um, so uh, make sure that you give him a hard time. Uh, <laughs> That's what he gets for not being here today. He's probably, he was speaking with some people uh, whenever I came down. So, uh, yeah, give him a hard time, and um, I pray that the uh, Bible study goes well, because Pastor Nate is one of the best pastors in the country, if not in the world. (laughs) 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> so we were reviewing, last week we talked about our first real offering, the burnt offerings. One of the um, most holy offerings, right? Nothing is eaten out of it. It is uh, all burnt up. And something I failed to mention was that the burnt offering is for atonement, okay? All the offerings have a form of atonement, meaning forgiveness, uh, being welcomed into the sight of God. That is incorporated into all of the sacrifices. However, there are some major portions, portions in there and think teachable moments that point to what is going on, how is God providing for his people, okay? Um, again, we talked about it's fulfilled in Christ, right? The burnt offering was supposed to be a male without blemish. Blood was spilt onto the altar, and the smoke going up was a pleasing sacrifice to the Lord, reminding us of Christ being a pleasing sacrifice at baptism, where the Father says, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased, and also at the Mount of Transfiguration. Something to note, um, our priests are our good um, Boy Scouts. They keep the campfire, I mean, not the campfire, the altar fire going perpetually, okay? That's something the Lord asked them to do. It's a reminder that his presence was with the people. Remember, his presence on Mount Sinai was the fire and smoke, uh, the cloud, and all that descended onto the tabernacle. And I will leave the uh, part one, part two stuff up. Uh, for in your notes for a while, uh, just to remind us of where we are. Green offering today in chapter 2 and a little bit in chapter 6 dealing with the priests. So with that, let's go ahead and open up. I'll move a slide forward here. Uh, Leviticus chapter 2, and we'll read 1 through 16, and then we'll look at chapter 6, 14 through 23. So, Leviticus chapter 2. Why is it named Leviticus? From the tribe of Levi, the priests who are heavily involved in the, um, the rituals here. Leviticus chapter 2. When anyone brings a grain offering as an offering to the Lord, his offering shall be a fine flour. He shall pour oil on it and put frankincense on it and bring it to Aaron's sons, the priest. And he shall take from it a handful of the fine flour and oil and all of its frankincense. And the priest shall burn it this as a memorial portion on the altar, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Um, Pastor Borchers, you asked uh, last class about how do we know there is a presiding priest? And it really comes down to the plural priests and singular priests, which we see here. The priest shall burn at this as a memorial offering. The, the, when it's singular, it is uh, specific actions taking place, and so it's a pres presiding priest over that offering. Continuing in verse 3, But the rest of the grain offering shall be for Aaron and his sons. It is a most holy part of the Lord's food offering. When you bring a grain offering baked in the oven as an offering, it shall be unleavened loaves of fine flour mixed with oil or unleavened wafers smeared with oil. And if your offering is a grain offering baked on a griddle, it shall be a fine flour unleavened mixed with oil. You shall break it in pieces and pour oil on it. It is a grain offering. And if your offering is a grain offering cooked in a pan, it shall be made of fine flour with oil. And you shall bring the grain offering that is made of these things to the Lord. And when it is presented to the priest, he shall bring it to the altar. And the priest shall take from the grain offering its memorial portion and burn this on the altar, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. But the rest of the grain offering shall be for Aaron and his sons. It is a most holy part of the Lord's food offering. No grain offering that you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven, for you shall burn no leaven nor any honey as a food offering to the Lord. As an offering of first fruits, you may bring them to the Lord, but they shall not be offered on the altar for a pleasing aroma. You shall season all your grain offerings with salt. You shall not let the salt of the covenant with your God be missing from your grain offering, 
With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. If you offer a grain offering of first fruits to the Lord, you shall offer for the grain of grain offering of your first fruits fresh ears, roasted with fire, crushed new grain, and you shall put oil on it and lay frankincense on it. It is a grain offering, and the priest shall burn as this memorial portion some of the crushed grain and some of the oil with all of its frankincense. It is a food offering to the Lord. All right, put a finger there. We're going to turn a few pages here to Leviticus chapter 6, starting with verse 14. And we'll go through uh, verse 23. This is dealing with the priests and their actions with this. And this is the law of the grain offering. The sons of Aaron shall offer it before the Lord in front of the altar. And one shall take from it a handful of the fine flour of the grain offering and its oil and all the frankincense that is on the grain offering and burn this as a memorial portion on the altar, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And the rest of it Aaron and his sons shall eat. It shall be eaten unleavened in a holy place. In the court of the tent of meeting, they shall eat it. It shall not be baked with leaven. I have given it as their portion of my food offerings. It is a thing most holy, like the sin offering and the guilt offering. Every male among the children of Aaron may eat of it, as decreed forever throughout your generations. From the Lord's food offerings, whatever touches them shall become holy." The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, This is the offering that Aaron and his son shall offer to the Lord on the day when he is anointed. That is, Aaron. A tenth of an ephah, a fine flour. An ephah is a bushel, uh, 35 liters or nine and a quarter uh, gallons. So this is a tenth of that. A fine flour as a regular grain offering, half of it in the morning and half in the evening. It shall be made with, an, with oil on a griddle. You shall bring it well mixed in baked pieces like grain offering and offer it for a pleasing aroma to the Lord. The priest from among Aaron's son who is anointed to succeed him, that would be the high priest, shall offer it to the Lord as decreed forever. The whole of it shall be burned. Every grain offering of a priest shall be wholly burned. It shall not be eaten. All right. That's to read through the text, dealing with grain offerings here. And uh, I was reading through the commentary, and the idea was, what is that fine flour that we read in chapter 2? Do we have any farmers, any uh, millers who've done, messed with wheat? Okay, good, because then the, the videos will be uh, really useful for you today to understand what is actually happening when wheat is milled out to be flour. Um, I looked it up. I, I found it quite interesting. The whole process needed to make sure that they actually had the right offering for the Lord. Mind you, you can offer grain offering and other things like that, but this particular offering, grain offering, uh, was prescribed by the Lord in such a way that it had to be processed and made and brought before uh, the Lord just as much as the animal sacrifices for the burnt offering were uh, killed in such a manner. Um, the grain offering is given to the Lord in a very prescribed manner as well. So let me pull up those videos. <laughs> Give me just a second. Let me get the volume up here a little bit. Yeah. This should be, let's go up to 40. 35. And then you need volume. Well, it gets kind of quiet behind that. Please turn on. Okay, I think the batteries are done on this one. You may have to just deal with it for right now, okay? All right. Um, this one is speaking about basically the different types of 
food that you get out of the wheat berry. They call it a wheat berry. Um, and so I'm going to leave this so our online viewers. Oh, yes. Online viewers. I left um, some links in the um, com uh, comments there. So if the video doesn't come through very well, please um, take a look at those videos um, later on. And uh, they're, they're really informative. Leave this here. It's a family business. We've been here for 300 years, maybe more. Hi, I'm Alex, and I'm here to show you what happens inside a modern flour mill. These days, it's quite difficult to get inside a modern flour mill. They're big factories uh, with lots of machines in them that produce the flour that we use uh, for so many of our foodstuffs. In the flour mill, there are various types of machines, ranging from roller mills, which crush and grind the wheat, to sieving machines, which sieve out different sized particles, to purifiers, to brand finishes, all of which we will see. Um, this helps to achieve the end goal of producing flour. Although they're big, and although they're modern, what happens inside isn't so very different to what happened uh, hundreds or even thousands of years ago. What they're doing is taking wheat, which is the grain that we use, and converting it into flour. In fact, they do it a little more slowly than the old-fashioned stone mills. It takes about an hour for wheat to go right through a modern flour mill uh, compared with a few minutes in an old stone mill. It starts off with the same material, wheat that comes from the farm, it's harvested by a combine harvester, but when it comes from the farm, uh, there's still some straw, some stones, and some chaff that have to be separated out. And mills do this with a variety of different machines. They use <coughs> sieves to separate out the chaff, uh, they use magnets to take away any fragments of metal that are still there in the cycle, uh, and they use special sorting machines to take away stones uh, that are still there in the sample. So once it's been cleaned, we have a nice sample of clean wheat, which is ready to go onto the flour. And wheat's one of our most important food grains. There's about 650 million tonnes of wheat produced every year around the world, which is used for feeding people. And that's what we use for making bread, biscuits, lots of other foodstuffs. It's one of the most important things uh, that we have uh, growing on the farms around the world. Everything that comes out of a flour mill is here in the grain, and none of it is wasted. It will all be used for making food for human consumption, or any that's not required for us will be used for animal feed. So the miller's job is to try and separate the grain into its different parts. So inside here, there's white flour ready to be extracted, there's bran from the outside, and there's wheat germ. The way this is done is through a gradual process. This is the same wheat after it's been on the flour mill for a few seconds in the first break system. So in here, there's the bran from the outside, some nice white flour which is to be separated out. This is some wheat after a few seconds in the flour mill when it's been through the first break system. You can see there's the skin of the, of the wheat, which is the bran, and the miller's going to try and keep these pieces as big as possible so you can separate out the flour uh, from the bran. And in fact, everything that comes out of the flour later on is already here in this bowl. If I give it a bit of a shake, you can see the bran sitting on the top, and here in the bottom are some nice white flour. And that's the miller's job, to sift the flour, sift this material, 
grind it up, treat it separately. A few minutes later on in the flower mill, this is semolina. As you can see, there's a lot more white flour in here because the large pieces of brown have been separated out. And this will be put through a machine known as a purifier, which blows air through the stocks and separates out the small particles of brown and allows the semolina to be cleaned up a little bit. So it looks like this, nice whiter semolina, which is the same sort of uh, food that you can make puddings out of. You can make semolina from wheat, which is what flour millers do. You can make semolina from other grains as well. It's got a nice coarse sandy texture and that's going to be ground up to make fine white flour. A few minutes later on in the flour mill, this is white flour. It's almost got a silky texture to it, quite different to the semolina. And that's perfect for making bread, or depending on the wheat that's been selected, uh, biscuits, pastry, cakes. That's the white flour. It's from the very center of the grain. If you want to make wholemeal, you simply mix the white flour back uh, with the, the bran that was separated out earlier on. The bran and the germs all been put back in here so that it is in exactly the same proportion as it was in the original grain. And there are little particles of bran you can see sitting in a, in a wholemeal flour. We don't eat as much wholemeal flour as we do white, and quite a lot of the bran that's taken off is used to make uh, it's sold as bran, or it's used to make uh, breakfast cereals like all bran, bran flakes. But even then, we don't use all the bran. So some of that will be ground up here with the screenings to make wheat feed, which is used for animals. So this goes to feed the chickens and the pigs. So nothing gets wasted in the flannel. Everything that comes in goes out again, either for us to eat or for the animals to eat. So here it is, the finished. Got to make sure they can hear me. All right. Um, He's a little bit boring for early in the morning. Um, I think when I watched it the first time, I was so enthralled with everything. He sounded so interesting to me. But this morning, he was not as interesting as I was hoping he would be. But um, Yeah, come on. Come on. All right. Um, something I failed to uh, kind of give you a chart of is this is the kernel of wheat here. And you remember he was talking about the fly, flour, the uh, bran. Well, there's other things going on here too. So the bran is the outside coating of the, the wheat berry. The endosperm, which is what we really get our flour from, is the kind of white portion of the uh, wheat berry that's used to help grow the plant. And then you have the germ, which is the actual plant there that would sprout up and grow. Um, bran is taken off so that you can get the fine flour, including the germ in our regular um, flour that we get from the, the store. Because if you keep the germ in there, it has oils and other things like that and it'll actually uh, have your flour spoil. So the whole process here is remove the bran, remove the germ, and keep the endosperm for the fine flour, um, which they have all different types of processes for, including all the way back uh, at Mount Sinai here. I got one more video to show you, and this is more about how um, uh, threshing and winnowing take place. Mm-hmm. 
Hey everybody, today I'm going to show you how to make flour from wheat, from the actual plant. Now I know you've seen pictures of this, but you've probably never seen a whole field of it. This is winter wheat right down the road from my house. Let me show you a picture. To get wheat flour, first you have to separate the wheat berry from all of this hull, and that's called threshing. Then you need to winnow all of the chaff away from the wheat berry. And I'm going to show you how to do that. Now, all of this is industrial now. They've got equipment that will do all of this right in the field. I'm just going to show you how to do it old school, maybe with a little bit of a modern homesteader twist. We're not talking about making 50 pound sacks of flour. I'm just showing this out of concept alone. So obviously the first thing that you would need is the wheat. And this is dried. And let me show you a close up. Each one of these little segments contains a wheat berry. And the wheat berry has a little hull around it. You want to get around all that chaff. Okay, that's called the chaff. You don't want to eat that. So this is what you want. That little tiny piece of wheat. And then this can be ground into flour. You can bake your bread out of it. Now you'll notice three of these just popped out. It pops out pretty easily. For All right, keep in mind, this is just for proof of concept. This is not an efficient way to do it. This is not the way anybody does it. I'm just showing you how to do the process. So basically, first you need to separate the heads of the wheat away from the stems. Normally you do this with a sickle in the field. I'm just gonna cut the stems. I'm just gonna stick this in the pillowcase. Okay, next, I'm just going to basically thresh it. That means whack it, bang it, try to break all those little seeds off. Sometimes they would use a flail for this. That's a special tool that kind of flails it. I'm just basically beating it against concrete. The other thing I've seen people do is beat it with a stick. There you go, bad beat, bad beat. Crumple it with your hands, shimmy it and shake it. That's called threshing. Okay, now that I've threshed it, I'm just going to dump it out onto the screen. Here's the threshed wheat, and obviously we're going to throw all this out. But look at we've got all this grain hidden in with all the chaff. But how are you going to separate that? We're going to do it by winnowing. What is winnowing? Well, in its simplest form, you would drop the wheat and chaff, and the wind, if it's a windy day, would blow the chaff away, and the wheat berries, being heavier, would fall down onto the ground, directly below. So since it's not very windy today, our chaff is not really separating that well, so I've got another idea. All right, let me show you my idea. I've got a fan, I've got a bucket to catch the wheat berries, and all the chaff's gonna fly that way when I turn this fan on. You ready? That was phase one of separating the wheat from the chaff. And it did a pretty good job. Now I'm gonna run it through a second, maybe a third time, and just try to get rid of all the light chaff. Here goes round two. And this is what it looks like after the second exposure to wheat. Now, I'll do this maybe one more time, but you get the idea. Here's the cleaned wheat berries, and now I'm going to put them through an old-fashioned grinder. And these are two millstones, and the flour will come out here as I grind it. And here we have it, the final product. Directly from the field, this is the wheat on the stalk. And here we have the milled flour, ready to make bread or pie crust or dumplings. And it's whole wheat and it's delicious.
All right. Do I have a loaf of whole wheat? No, not a whole wheat bread. It's actually a fine bleached bread over there, but. All right. Pastor, I know a place that they do that all the time. Really great wheat. Okay, where is that? Well, and it's called winter wheat, and it's Russian red wheat. Yeah. That it was because of the, what Russia did during the early 19th, 18th, or 20th century that we got their wheat because they expelled all the Mennonites. Oh, wow. They brought that wheat with them called Turkey Red Wheat yeah. to uh, Southwest Kansas. And, uh, that's where it is. In fact, in fact, 95% of the land in Kansas is farm. Wow, 95% in Kansas. You remember that first video we watched, how boring it was? Well, Pastor Borchers is not boring whenever he told us all about those facts. You got a little, little excited telling us about a wheat there, but no, it's really interesting that Mennonites from Russia kicked out, expelled, gave us a winter red wheat uh, that, that we can use. Turkey red wheat. Turkey red wheat. Uh, Russia would be the bread basket. Wow, that's really interesting. Um, well, um, thanks communism, I guess. Um, never say that. Never, never say that, okay. Um, let me add just something real quick. You mentioned winter red uh, turkey wheat or red turkey wheat. Um, for you bakers, uh, depending on the season and depending on the type, we'll get you your cake flour, your uh, regular baking flour, and things like that. Um, so there's a lot going into just the science and the use of, of, of wheat throughout the centuries. Yes. Well, at this weekend, and it's today, there's a steam show east of New Haven. Okay. Um, and they have a threshing machine. Yeah. And um, we didn't see it operating yesterday, but we saw, so if you want to go and see how your grandfather would have threshed, they, the machines are expensive and they travel from farm to farm. Cool. Okay, so a threshing machine right. out east of New Haven for... What was it? Today's the last day. But what was the, the if I were steam to look show. at Steam Show, thank you. Just say Steam Show in Haven 2022. And it'll find it. Well, thank you for that. Yeah. Um, I show you those videos, and thank you for the comments made by Pastor Borchers, even though I picked on you a little bit, and Deb here. Um, I showed you those because we sometimes think that the animal offerings are the most spectacular, the best. But this goes to show you how much care was needed to create the flour needed for the offerings and then to bake it nonetheless. And so what we get here is a, um, oh, let's, let's, we're gonna skip that today. It's a family offering. Uh, it, the, this offering took everybody to do, just as much as the animals took care and people to be uh, help, helping with the shepherding or herding of the livestock. This took everybody, and it was an offering uh, for the can, that could be put together by the family, and it's also an offering for those that were not shepherds or herders, but people who were farmers. And so this allowed uh, it to be taught to the people that it's not animals that make the best sacrifice. It's the, the, the faith of the people, whether that's an animal sacrifice or a grain sacrifice. Now, something to note here is this is the first time that the uh, offering given to the Lord is actually then given uh, onto the priest, right? So this is uh, an God's gift to the priests it's, uh, to help feed them and as they do their job as priests for the Lord. Uh, something that is added here is salt. Uh, it's a symbol of friendship, of uh, joining together. Um, and let's actually take a look at Ezra, chapter 4, and Ezra, to give you uh, some context here, right? Nehemiah and Ezra are building the wall, and um, people are not too happy about the fact that they're trying to rebuild Jerusalem. So let's turn to Ezra. Um, there, in your history portion of your Bible, 
uh, before you get to Psalms. We're looking at Ezra chapter 4. Ezra chapter 4, and we're looking at verses 11 through 16. I hear a few pages still flipping there. I'll, I'll, I'll stall for you, okay? Um, when I say symbol of friendship, it's showing that there is, uh, actually, it goes so far as a covenant between people, that there's a promise uh, that they will remain together. And so when we look at Ezra 4, 11, we're going to see that. And this is uh, people who are... Um, writing against the building of the wall and building of Jerusalem to Artaxerxes. So verse 11. This is a copy of the letter that they sent. To Artaxerxes the king, your servants, the men of the province beyond the river, send greeting. And now be it known to the king that the Jews who came up from you to us have gone to Jerusalem. They are rebuilding that rebellious and wicked city. They are finishing the walls and repairing the foundations. Now be it known to the king that if this city is rebuilt and the walls finished, they will not pay tribute, custom, or toll, and the royal revenue will be impaired. If you've got to make an argument, always go to money first, okay? Now, this is the important verse here in verse 14. Now because we eat the salt of the palace, and it is not fitting for us to witness the king's dishonor, Therefore, we send and inform the king. So what they're saying is because we have come into your palace, eaten of your food, eaten of the salt that was given, we are part of your friendship, covenant promises here. Uh, we are loyal to you and you are loyal to us. And so we are bringing this letter to you so you don't have dishonor. Continuing verse 15, in order that search may be made in the book of the records of your fathers, you will find in the book of the records and learn that this city is a rebellious city, hurtful to kings and provinces, and that sedition was stirred up in, front, in it from of old. That is why the city was laid waste. We make known to the king that if this city is rebuilt and its walls finished, you will then have no possession in the province beyond the river. So basically, they write a letter saying, we have, we're your friends. We've made promises and, and worked uh, a deal out between each other because we've eaten salt. So take a look at what's going on in Jerusalem. And so salt is added into the, the grain offerings. Yes, it's a preservative. I think practically it reminds us that God provides life, right? Remember, all these symbols are pointing to life and not death, not rot and decay. And so having fine flour means that it's not going to decay. Um, and so also adding salt to it also means it won't decay. Yeah. Because yeah. at the time, it was necessary for life. It's necessary for a life now. Yeah. If you don't have salt, you die. Right. And so it was actually money at that time. So like the Roman Empire used it to pay soldiers. Absolutely. So that's a monetary sacrifice. Thank you for uh, pointing that out. And Art? That's where we get the word salary from. Yes, yes, that's right. It's a salt. Yeah. Think, yeah, you're, how much salt you're getting, how much salary you're getting. Thank you, uh, Pastor Nate and Art, on that one. Um, what else was added to the grain offering was frankincense. Um, and it was part of the daily incense. Um, and we didn't read that. That's in Exodus. Uh, twice a day there's to put incense, a holy incense, a prescribed um, recipe into the tent of meeting on the altar of incense uh, twice a day, once in the morning and the evening. Um, and that's actually Exodus 30. But just for time's sake today, I'm going to move forward. Frankincense, um, if you were part of our Hope Session classes, which they're starting up here soon, September 27th, um, Lindy and I did a class on the, um, oh, goodness gracious, herbs and spices and smells and stuff in the Bible. And Lindy and I purchased... Um, actual frank, uh, frankincense here. So this is the resin. Lindy also has myrrh and the oils of these two and several other things that are mentioned in the Bible. I'd like you to uh, pass this around, take a sniff um, of it. This is what was being added to the, uh, the offering before the Lord. So I'll start over here. Pass it around, take a sniff. Um, 
it's fairly expensive, so if you want to take something home, just take a few granules there. Don't take the whole thing. Um, yes, Art. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, incense and evening sacrifice, reminding us of the daily offering. The um, we always have to put into context. All of these sacrifices give up a pleasing aroma to the Lord, right? And our prayers are the incense, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And we'll we'll talk about those type of things as we kind of wrap up the core of these offerings here in our first section of Leviticus. Um, so, something to note is frankincense is not added to the eaten portion by the priest. No. Anybody want to have, uh, have an idea why? No. Why frankincense is not added to the eating portion of the grain offering to the priest? No. It, it's, it's actually not necessarily lethal, but it can be. It will cause you a big old stomach, stomach ache and you will heave it up. And I don't think it would taste good either. And it would be expensive. It would be very expensive. So the process that, uh, much like um, taking sap from a maple tree, you actually have to scar the tree. Uh, the resin comes out, you, you take that in. Um, and you can destroy a tree easily in one season if you don't do it right. In fact, um, they run into that issue uh, throughout the world in the uh, economy of making friends frankincense is that you can make a lot but kill a tree or you make a little and keep your trees for a long time and so they balance that if you got somebody who wants to make a quick buck they can go through all the trees scar them up kill them get a lot of incense out of it make some money and move on from there and so that happens sometimes as people buy the property use it maybe for another farming process but just easily uh, kill the trees and there's actually really only so much that the world can make of frankincense and myrrh. Um, but yeah, so as that's burned, I would imagine that really makes a great smell. Have, has anybody ever burned flour in the kitchen? Never burned flour. Not on purpose, okay. I burned flour in the kitchen. It smells pretty horrible. So I think adding a little bit of uh, incense to it might, made a, might have helped that out a little bit. So those are the things added. Did anybody have any questions about those things? Well, the grain offering was the flour. Did they also bring something that was already baked? Yes. So um, I didn't touch on it. And um, I think probably I'll hand it off to Pastor Nate next time to really kind of go into those things. Um, but grain, it was grain and baked items. And there's three baked items that could be involved uh, with that offering. And so... Um, it's not necessarily that you're only bringing flour. You could. You could also bring, bring a finished product like a cake. I'm not a cake that we think about it, but like a, like a pancake. Because the deal is, uh, one of the things you can't have in it is you can't have any leaven. Again, with these symbols, we have to look at why does God say yes to this, but no to that, right? Um, Yes, no to leaven. Why no to yeast in the bread? Anybody ever made hardtack before? No. Not purposely, okay. <laughs> so my buddy Preston, he's a Civil War reenactor, and uh, they would make hardtack for whenever they would go out. Um, um, I guess, what would be the right word? To reenact, I guess? Yes. Yeah. And um, any event, go um, sleep out in the fields. And you had to have food that was reasonably within re um, the context of it. Call that period food. Period food. Okay. Thank you, Chuck. Everything has to be 19th century. Yeah, 19th century. Yeah. Uh, but they would have hardtack, which is a bread that's quite hard, but it wouldn't rot uh, very quickly. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, and that's what the was standard fare for the soldiers. Worms could still get in. Yeah. Yeah. So. A little added nutrition. Little, little, uh, yeah, protein in there. Yeah. Uh, so, Chuck, for those online, was saying that heart attack is good, still gets worms and bugs in it. So, just uh, make sure you chew thorough, thoroughly. Um, 
But yeah, so the leaven would actually encourage uh, decay, um, rot, because of the nature of opening up the, uh, the, the bread to the in environment and to the elements. Yes? Did it have anything to do with the exodus uh, no. that uh, God said to uh, make bread without mm -hmm. leaven? Absolutely, because he wanted them to be able to move quickly, right, right with then. staff in hand, no. right? And That's what I was going to say. Yep. These takes time to rise. Yes, it does. It does take time to rise. Um, here, though, they don't necessarily have to be on the run, right? right. But yet God still continues that symbol uh, to remind them of what happened in the past, that he passed over their sins, and then he adds to it, reminds them that the yeast and leaven generates this symbol of decay, and he wants to always be reminding them that in him is life, okay? And so it continues to broaden the symbology of what we have there with leaven. Yes, Art? You know, all these offerings you're talking about, and you know, we think of like our offerings in the church, for instance, um, this cost people money. I mean, they killed an animal. That yeah. animal could have tried to do food for their family, mm -hmm. or they could have sold it to somebody, or bartered with it, same thing with the grain. So when these people are taking something and burning it, or killing it and you know, giving it away, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's, did you say in the animal sacrifices, some of them were every day? Uh, so, yes, some of the sacrifices, well, actually, when we get into sin offerings, okay. uh, we'll get into really the, the offerings that are, can be given every day. It really is a sacrifice on their part. Yes, absolutely. Uh, they are spending time, energy, uh, their own assets. And, you know, if you got a male without blemish, right, that's good breeding stock too, right? And so, yes, the Lord has to provide for them in that way, and it's also a sacrifice giving up what God has given to them. Yes, Sue? And uh, leaven, uh, sort of pride, it puffs up. Yeah, yeah. It puffs up. And Jesus said, beware the leaven. Yeah, um, I know what you're talking about. I have to look at the context again on what that was, um, but you're probably right on the being puffed up. Um, adding to God's law, I bet you that's probably where it's getting at. If, you, if anybody wants to help me out with that, I'll look it up and get real specific, but I think it has to do with the fact that they add to the law they, um, as much as leaven adds to, uh, to bread. I'll write that in there in the Pharisee. Okay, so um, no leaven, and in your text it read no honey, but it's better translated as no syrup, okay? So a fruit syrup, a honey on there. Again, adding that sugar allows for decay and rot to happen quicker. All right, so one thing I did not put in your notes here, and you might want to add it in the, before this, is that they added oil to the grain offerings, right? Uh, so they cooked it, fried it uh, in oil, and typically probably olive oil there. I can't remember off the top of my head uh, why that was the case, but I would like you to put that in there just so that you keep it in your memory bank. Um, yes, Jordan. Um, when Solomon finished the temple, he sacrificed thousands. Yes. Thousands of animals. Right, and you gotta, in some of those sacrifices, right, you throw the blood on the altar? Yes. I can't imagine the river of yes. blood that would come out of it. Um, and, it's, and that's a symbol in and of itself to the best perfect sacrifice, the eternal blood spilt for us, yes. and a cleansing flood for God's people. I'm looking at the time right here. Um, anybody? Let me get my phone. My that clock, it is seven. It is nine, uh, ten fifteen. We'll close it here. What works out well is I've already done all the big preparation for Pastor Nate. He'll continue our discussion <laughs> on grain offerings, um, and probably move us forward into peace offerings a little bit there. Um, but thank you for um, kind of the sh abbreviated class today. Thank you for watching those videos. I think it gets a better perspective on what type of process it took to bring an offering to the Lord. Let us pray. 
Heavenly Father, we ask that you be with us each and every day. Uh, remind us of the offerings that we give to you, that they are first a blessing uh, that you have given to us. Lord, uh, we ask that uh, as we enter your presence, um, every, each time that we enter into worship and into your word, Lord, help us to remember what it took for an Israelite to enter into your presence. And now you've given us that free access to the Son through that narrow door, uh, through the means of grace. And we thank you, Lord. And we pray this all in your Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Added note, if you're in 1030 worship service, pay attention to the epistle text for today. I think you'll find that it really resonates what we're learning about in Leviticus.